On his plane from a lake bed, turned to ceramic words like this. From Eric Lessing and the Culture of Fine Arts Archive in New York, the earliest surviving ceramic artifact is the Venus of Willendorf, dating back to 24,000 BC. Ever since then, ceramics has been an ever-evolving craft. Being a student for nearly two of those years, I've learned the various ins and outs of this art form. If you've ever been curious how the objects you use every day are made, I can help you satisfy your curiosity. The ceramic pottery process has four main steps, shaping, drying, the first firing, and the second firing. Let's jump straight into the creation of ceramic wares. First things first, you need a place to create it. Here's my home pottery studio. I have the basic tools I need for what I like to make. I started out at the high school studio in Pullman, and there's also a privately owned studio in town called Terracotta. I've used all and all work great for my needs. Now, if we're actually creating things, there's a couple different techniques we can use. The first technique I'd like to go over is hand sculpting. Here's some of the things that I've made with just my hands and basic tools. Using hand sculpting is very easy to into because you're just using your hands or something very basic. And that makes it easy to get into. The next technique I use the most and my favorite is wheel throwing. This is where you throw on a horizontal spinning wheel. It, I like how fast and symmetrical wheel throwing is. You can see me in a couple of these pictures enjoying it. <laughs> Simon Leach's pottery handbook states that if you don't have a clay ball on the wheel, you aren't going to have a healthy pot. Simple as that. This reinforces the importance of symmetry on the wheel. One con I would say about getting a wheel is the buy-in. Personally, I got my wheel that I keep in my home studio for about $200, but professional wheels can go easily over 1000 which is quite surprising to me. Clay also can be shaped with the third most and probably least used for art is casting slip. Slip is when clay is in its liquid most state with the most water in it. And slip casting is whenever you pour slip in a mold and it creates an exact copy of what you took the mold of. This is generally used in mass production or creating copies of art. Clay behaves differently depending on how much water is in it. Like I just mentioned with slip, that's the watery most stage of clay. It's used for slip casting and it can be used for decoration when it's thicker and piped. Wet clay, which I have here today, is, can be defined as leaving a fingerprint once you press your finger in it. It's moldable. This is what you use for hand sculpting and wheel throwing. After the clay dries for about 24 hours, it becomes leather hard. This is where potters trim or carve into their pottery. Like I carved these plates in this top middle picture, that's after the clay was leather hard and allowed me to carve the clay. Lastly, whenever the clay is drying for about a week or more, it becomes something you call bone dry. This is where all the water moisture in the clay is completely gone. You can't carve it, you can't mold it. And if you try, that happens. From Susan Peterson's book, The Craft and the Art of Clay, once the piece passes the leather hard state, wet clay cannot be added because shrinkage has taken place. This means if I tried to add a handle to a mug that's already dried, it wouldn't work because the mug has already dried and shrunk. Like you can see the shrinkage rates on the picture on the right. And as I've just shown you, the clay is very fragile when it's bone dry. And if it did make it this far and didn't break, it's ready for the first firing or baking. So firing is basically cooking the clay, but you can't do this in your traditional oven. So you have to do it in something called a kiln. This is basically an oven which gets really, really hot. I have a picture of a kiln that I use here in the middle, and they can be powered by gas, wood, or electricity. But I personally only use electric kilns in the have only used electric kilns in the past, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So the first firing in clay that which brings clay to bisquare is called the bisquare firing. This is where the clay is heated to its vitrification point at around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. According to Dave Finkelberg in his Bisque Firing 101 article, accredited by Ceramics Monthly Articles, 
it had just become stronger and denser. This occurs as the kiln's temperature continues to rise and the edges of the clays bond together. You can see this picture in the top right by Fingelberg's study about how the clay particles melt and shrink together in the bisquare firing. Here on the left, I have some pictures of the bisquare, which I personally fired, and you can visibly see the pores in the clay and how it's more porous, but also more dense. So how do you get from bisquare to a glassy, um, how do you get from bisquare to a glassy surface? How does it become this dense, porous, sponge-like surface to a ceramic mug, which is shiny? That's where glaze comes in. For glaze, Leslie S.'s article on glaze firing published by the Potter Wheel says that it is silica in glaze that creates the liquid gloss during the firing that goes solid as the pottery cools. This is what forms the glossy glass-like surface on the glazed pot. So we have to fire the clay once again with glaze, which is like a paint, a silica paint. And as it's, you, there's different ways to apply it. You can apply it with a brush, which most people do, or you can see me dipping it in a jar of glaze here in this picture on the left. And after it's dipped or brushed, the bisquare is so porous, it absorbs the water in the clay and it leaves a silica deposit. That silica deposit is then fired in a glaze we're firing, which is around 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. That silica then melts and deposited on the work, the bisquare surface and creates a watertight glassy surface. And you get a finished product similar to this. Myself and potters like me do this every day because there's something we love about this process. I personally think the rich history of ceramics and the idea of creating this finished ware from a blob of clay is what piques my fascination in this hobby. From the simplicity of wet clay to the complexity of a glaze masterpiece, this process teaches us that true artistry lies not only in the finished product, but in the story of its creation. Thank you.